I dropped my monster footprints that I use for my magnum feet. I'm Eden Madison. Welcome back to the Lore Lodge. On October 6th, 1958, the Humboldt Standard introduced the world to Bigfoot, a giant ape man who stalked around a Bluff Creek logging camp for weeks, leaving his massive footprints as evidence of his presence. And towards the end of that article, the author slips in that tales of Bigfoot are old Indian legend, and that may sound like it's pure superstition based on the lack of specificity, but he's actually completely correct that there was a, a legend. On October 7th, 1958, in the Reading-based record Searchlight, journalist Garth Sanders wrote that long before the white man came, the Indians living along the Klamath and Trinity Rivers told stories of a monster called the Indian Devil. And while no real information about what this legend was is given by Sanders, there is a 1916 book by a U-Rock author by the name of Lucy Thompson called To the American Indian, in which she told about her history, her culture of her U-Rock people. The book was co-authored with her white husband, and there are a few segments where you're reading it and you're like, okay, I feel like maybe he had some input here. But in chapter 9, she tells the story of this Indian devil as it was perceived by her people, at least the overview version. There is a later chapter that we'll go over where she talks about a specific story of a woman by the name of Oslako. In the overview, though, in chapter 9, she says that this Indian devil was a beast that had once been a man. That for some reason, they had gone off into the wild, they had forgotten the tongue of their mothers, and that they would live by, you know, walking around making strange noises and never settling. That they were roaming about at all times. One might interpret this as meaning that they started to speak a different language or just started speaking in gibberish, and that they were nomadic, if you look at it as more of a tribal kind of thing. And what was so frightening about these wild men specifically was that they were known to kidnap Native American women for wives. And when these women who were kidnapped would return on occasion, they would tell stories about how they lived these wild ways out as animals and that even their children took after their husbands. Some of these women would become captivated by the Indian devils, which meant that they actually returned to the wild. They forsook their own background, their own way of life, to go out and live this kind of natural quote-unquote way. In that second account I mentioned, where there's a specific example of the story of the woman Oslako, we get a little bit more detail about what this situation entails. This woman, Aslako, is spirited away from the village of Wetchpeck by two of the wild men and taken to a canyon, a dark, deep canyon, in the heart of the Redwoods. It's said that these wild men were rich in all kinds of Indian wealth and that the one who made Aslako his wife dressed her in the finest buckskin dresses and gave her this beautiful uh, shell necklace and that they just all these lavish gifts. She bore this wild man a son, and the legend, the account, says that both she and her husband were very proud of the boy, but of course, he took after her husband. He was wild, he roamed about, he made strange noises. But one day, after years of living out in the wild, Osloko went to her husband and she said, Hey, I would like to go home. I would like to see my family, and I would like them to meet my son. And he said, okay, that's fine, you can go as long as you promise to return. And of course she did, so he walked her most of the way to the village and then stayed back at a little clearing. There was some period of time agreed that she would return and then they'd go back to their home in the mountains. When Oslako returned and spoke to her own people, she told them how she was carried away over mountain and crag through large forests to a strange home in a cave in a cliff of rocks, and how she had enjoyed the comforts of a luxurious home. Which, these two things don't necessarily sound like they match. Very nice cave pad, I suppose. Pimp my cave. Thompson suggests that this is a canyon about 60 miles to the south at the headwaters of Redwood Creek. And while I should clarify the woman was kidnapped from Wetchpeck, she herself was from Rock Roy, and that's where the, the, uh, the wild man cave was south from. And she told her family that she and this husband of hers lived alone in a cave, which in many cases Native Americans would live in extended family groupings, so that would be a little bit odd. It would suggest some cultural differences between their people and the wild men, which of course 
Here, it said that the wild men, that there were two of them, which suggests that there was some kind of culture, because when they get back, it said that the wild men were rich in all sorts of Indian things. So, again, there's there seem to be some... Uh, it, things things tend to vary. There's some details that are not always clear. But if the wild men are some sort of tribe, then it seems they have different living practices from the Uruk. She also told them that when she had promised her husband she was going to return, she had lied, and that she had no intention of doing so. But she was having trouble because her six-year-old son just could not integrate into the Uruk village. He was too wild. He wanted to be out trouncing around the forests. He didn't want to be sitting around doing whatever little Uruk boys did. He would often run off into the bush and she would have to go and find him. And at this point, it had been a while. It had been weeks or even months. So her husband got curious. She hadn't come home yet. What was going on? So he goes to check and he creeps up right next to the village and he sits in some bushes and just watches. And he's trying to get his wife's attention, but he can't. So one day, he does manage to get the attention of his son. He calls the boy over and he tells him, hey, go get your mother, we need to go home, it's, it's time. But she tells her son when he goes to get her that she doesn't want to go and she, she wants to stay home. In fact, she had been avoiding the outskirts of the village this whole time in case he came back to try and kidnap her again. And speaking of legends, I'm sure that those of you who have been here a while remember the tales of my encounters with Bigfoot and the, the many injuries that arose as a result. While we were out researching the thick forests of the Pacific Northwest for the Saskets, I saw a flash of movement and was suddenly thrown into a tree. With my ankle swelling and my head just absolutely pounding, you will never guess who I saw. We hadn't encountered Bigfoot since things fell apart between his daughter and I, but boy, did he have some things to say about how that went down. In fact, he put me in the hospital. As a result, we've been in need of legal representation, so we looked far and wide until we found somebody that we could trust. Like many big law firms, Bigfoot can put up a big fight, so we needed somebody with the resources and the will to fight for us no matter what was thrown at us, or what we were thrown into in this case. That's why we went with America's biggest injury law firm, Morgan & Morgan, and there is a reason for their status and record. Morgan & Morgan has modernized the injury law process so that you can communicate with your legal team all from your smartphone. It only takes a few minutes to see if you have a case, and the fee is free unless you win. You can start your claim with Morgan & Morgan now with just one click at www.forthepeople.com slash lordlodge or by clicking the link in the description. And don't worry, we'll keep you updated about how our fight with Bigfoot is going and how Morgan & Morgan has been helping us along the way. But now back to the events at Bluff Creek back in October of 1958. Since Oslako did not want to go, but she didn't want to deprive her son of being allowed to be with his father should he so choose, and because she recognized that he clearly fit in better with the wild men, she gave him the choice to choose who, she, who he would live with. The boy chose to go and live with his father, and he was never seen again. Thompson called these living devils, these Indian devils, Oma'a, which is a term also used in Alfred Kreber's book, You Rock Myths, which was published in 1972 after his death. It was compiled from manuscripts written earlier, and of course he had spent several years in the early 1900s, I believe 1901 to 1907, living amongst the Uruk. In Kreber's account, these Uma'a were in fact spiritual beings who would hide out in the brush and they would hunt humans, they would cause sickness using poison arrows. But in my opinion, his informant seemed to be describing more of a physical being than a spiritual being. In the story he gives, the Uma'a has to eat, has to drink, it chases a man, and a boy is able to leave it marooned on an island off the coast of California. This specific island is called Redding Rock, and they go hunting for mussels there, and then they, the boy pushes off while the Uma'a is still looking for mussels, and paddles the four miles back to the coastline, only for the Uma'a to show up five days later having swum that distance. Unfortunately, Kreber recorded very little else regarding the subject. So, while both Kreber and Thompson have their limitations as far as their accounts go, they do show that the Uruk held a belief in a dangerous sort of wild man, and most importantly, they're not alone in that belief. In this video, we're going to be discussing the concept of Bigfoot as it appears in various Native American legends from across the North American continent. And the first thing I want to do is give a brief summary of how the Native American tribes and nations uh, developed and how they differed.
If your knowledge of Native Americans comes primarily from what you were taught in grade school, as it does for the vast majority of Americans, you're probably familiar with a few terms like Iroquois, Cherokee, Navajo, and whoever was local to you. For example, for us, it was the Lenai Lenape. What typically isn't very well explained is where these groups came from and how exactly they were different from one another. And in all fairness, we're still not totally sure when everyone got to the party. For a long time, it was the Clovis First Hypothesis, which placed it around 13,500 years ago, but in 2021, that was kind of permanently blown out of the water by the discovery of some footprints in New Mexico. That theory also held that people got here by crossing the Bering Strait ice bridge that connected Kamchatka and Alaska, and because that ice bridge was there for such a long period of time, even though we've pushed the date when people got here back, we haven't necessarily changed the way they got here, though it has been accepted that there were likely people who came across in canoes. In those cases, it's also believed that people may have paddled down the west coast of America instead of walking down, surviving based off of fish and seaweed. Some people have also suggested that it was even further back, like 50,000 years ago, and that is based on some controversial uh, evidence out of a place called Topper, a site in North Carolina. In any case, these first native peoples had a series of advancements and changes as their populations grew and expanded. And eventually they coalesced into these discernible cultures, which oftentimes were linked by linguistics. The Algic languages dominated the east coast of North America and then eventually spread into the interior during the second millennium AD, though it is possible that they originated on the west coast. There's a lot to go through there and we don't have time for it today. That west coast pocket is in fact the Uruk and the neighboring Wyat, whereas the east coast grouping is the Algonquin languages who we've talked about quite extensively. The uto aztecan languages covered most of the Great Basin and much of Mexico, and they were flanked to the west by the proposed Penutian family of languages, which would include the Plateau Penutian of the Klamath. An example of the uto aztecan would be the Numic peoples, such as the Paiute. Languages of the Salishan family were spoken in Washington and British Columbia, where the term Sasquatch originated. In the Midwest, in the heartland of the enigmatic and mysterious long-gone Mississippian culture, the Siouan and Catawan languages flourished, while a little bit to the east of that, the Iroquoian and Muscogean languages did the same. Exiles in a foreign land, the Diné-speaking peoples like the Navajo and Apache occupied the Four Corners region and much of the American Southwest, while the descendants of their ancestors, the Dene, took up most of Western Canada. Why bring all of that up, you may ask? Well, it's because in each one of those families, there is at least one tribe that has a legend similar to that of the Yurok Indian Devil. And since those original reports of Bigfoot referenced the local legend of the Indian Devil, we thought that when looking for Bigfoot in other tribes, that was the best place to start. As I said before, the Yurok and the Wyatt, despite being located on the far western extreme of the United States, are linguistically related to the Algonquin of the East Coast. Both groups being Algic speakers, we thought it was best to start with them. And there are two types of wild men in Algonquin tradition that come to mind, though one is considerably better documented than the other. Beginning with the more obscure of the two, we're going to look at William Strachey's 1612 work, History of Travel into Virginia Britannica. And in this case, it's really nothing more than an off-the-cuff remark that I noticed while we were doing research for our Roanoke video. While explaining that there's this rumor about survivors of that doomed colony, Strachey talks of another native settlement somewhere that seems to be to the southwest where they take apes in the mountains. The problem there is that there have not been non-human primates in North America for at least 26 million years. We can therefore assume that whatever these Algonquin were hunting in the mountains, they were not monkeys, but if they were Native Americans, then they would have been described as other Native Americans or other Indians. So that suggests that these apes were not considered to be humans. This doesn't necessarily mean that in reality they weren't humans. It could have been that the Algonquin simply didn't see them as such, or that Strachey misunderstood somebody talking about a tribe that lived as animals. That's really all that can be said about Strachey's ape men. The other wild man, however, is a bit more of a mixed bag, with stories across Algonquin lands ranging between man and monster. It's the Wendigo. 
My introduction to this concept came through the second episode of the TV show Supernatural, in which the Wendigo is depicted as this emaciated, gray-skinned man with super strength, super speed, and the ability to perfectly mimic voices and even throw them around the forest. The show did a decent job, but presented a limited version of the legend that was built for TV, though I am very thankful that there were no antlers. Truth be told, there is no singular correct version of the Wendigo, as each Algonquin tribe has its own tales. One of the best documented accounts of the Wendigo is that of Ojibwe scholar Basil H. Johnston, who was born on Perry Island and who was a member of the Chippewa of Nawash First Nation in Ontario. The word Wendigo in English is itself derived from the Ojibwe word Windigo, with variants such as Windego, Wingigo, and Wihitiko across the general Algonquin language family. Johnston's description is generally the one that you see when you look it up online, which is that the Wendigo was gaunt to the point of emaciation, its desiccated skin pulled tightly over its bones, with its bones pushing out against its skin, its complexion the ash gray of death, and its eyes pushed back deep in their sockets, the Wendigo looked like a gaunt skeleton recently disinterred from the grave. What lips it had were tattered and bloody, Unclean and suffering from superation of the flesh, the Wendigo gave off a strange and eerie odor of decay and decomposition. And in addition to that horrifying visage, the Wendigo may, depending on the story, also be a giant. For example, in another account given by an Ojibwe by the name of Peter York, a man fights a Wendigo who is large enough to use a whole tree as a club. The protagonist of the story faces the Wendigo in single combat, defeats him, and then burns the body of what he describes as a great big man. There's a similar tale passed down by the Chippewa scholar Lottie Marsden, but in that case, instead of it being just an ordinary man who can get special powers by envisioning animals in his sleep, it's a it's like a well-known culture hero. For some reason, I could not track down this one source that I used when I first did when I did one of our videos on the Wendigo. It's driving me insane. If anyone can find all of these legends as recorded by Lottie Marsden, please forward them to me. But I read them a while ago, and in our full video on the Wendigo and the Wachuge, I covered that bit. But the, the important part here is that in that story, it's largely the same, but instead of, you know, unnamed guy, it's well-known monster slayer. I would not be surprised if these stories derive from the same archetype. Marsden also wrote about a story in which a Wendigo abducts a boy, but it holds off on eating him because he is not yet fat enough. There's just not enough meat on his bones. And what it would do is, in order to check the amount of fat the boy had, it would use a knife to make a little slit in his hand and just check. This is important because it demonstrates that Wendigos are capable of tool use beyond just swinging a tree branch. This is, this is more of a complicated process. It also demonstrates that the Wendigo, while it is driven to eat human flesh, can exhibit restraint. It doesn't just eat every human it comes across. At one point in the story, because the boy needs food and won't eat human beings, and the Wendigo seems to refuse to hunt anything else, uh, he takes the boy to a village, and he tells the boy, go into the village, tell them that you need some food, and then just come back out here. But do not tell them that you are with a Wendigo, because that's not going to go well for me. This demonstrates a degree of intelligence, and in that the Wendigo knows to make sure that the boy goes and gets fed, but also doesn't reveal the situation in its entirety. Unfortunately, the Wendigo lacks the intelligence to realize that the young boy is immediately going to blab and explain to the village that he's been abducted by a Wendigo. So, the men of the village, not wanting there to be a Wendigo around in the first place, they get together into a posse, they go out, and they chop off this Wendigo's legs, and they leave him sitting against a tree to die. Assuming that they have done the job properly, and it, at the very least can't move, they go back to check and make sure it's dead, only to find that it is licking the marrow out of its own leg bones. At this point, they, they kill it, and it doesn't it's unclear exactly how, but they seem to be able to just chop it into pieces with axes, and then they also probably burn it. In both of the stories that Lottie Marsden gives, the Wendigo is described as being a giant. Another source I decided to take a look at was the 1988 journal article, The Wendigo in the... by the anthropologist Robert Brightman, in which he compares and contrasts accounts of the legend, including some by European Americans. William Strachey, for example, in the dictionary that he attached to his history of travel into Virginia Britannica, had the words Wintook and Wintookum, which he said meant fool. And the word transmitted by Strachey here is actually the Powhatan Algonquin word for Wendigo. It's been proposed that this is because they held the opinion that in order to eat human flesh, you must be a fool or a madman. 
And in some other cases, depending on which tribe you were a part of, it was believed that the Wendigo was in fact a malevolent spirit who would possess somebody and force them to eat human flesh. I also came across one account within Brightman's work that said that there were two concepts of the Wendigo. There was the, the Wendigo spirit and the Wendigo person. And so, of course, as you can see, you know, when, when you have something like this that's transmitted through oral tradition, it's going to vary quite a lot from place to place, but you can tell that they were all kind of reaching back towards the same idea. Another account comes from American fur trader Alexander Henry, who between 1763 and 1764 lived amongst the Ottawa people, who were close relatives of the Ojibwe and parts of the Council of Three Fires, and united through the Anishinaabe larger culture. During this time, he became acquainted with Anishinaabe Algonquin legends and tales, and he even was adopted as a brother by the Ottawa chief Wawatam. Wawatam. In 1809, Henry published Travels in Canada and the Indian Territories, in which he described an encounter with a man-eater north of Lake Ontario. This is on page 199 for those reading along. His story begins as he and a group of native companions are traveling towards Oak Bay, looking for fish during a winter famine, and at one point as they're encamped, a young man comes straggling out of the woods. He claimed to them that he had left his family behind because they were starving and unable to continue the journey. However, his appearance set something off with the other Native Americans. They, they saw that he was, you know, starving and he smelled horrible, like... Not like B.O., not like being dirty, but this, this reeking of death. And it worried them. They were concerned that this young man who had just come stumbling out of the forest towards them, that he had eaten human flesh. Such persons, Henry wrote, are known as Windigos among the Indians and are always regarded with horror. It was believed that once a person ate human flesh, they were a Wendigo, and there was no getting them back. In some versions, there are shamans who are able to bring a person back, but for the most part, not so much. And the average man, of course, could not do that. If you encountered one and you didn't have one of these really special shamans on you, you were probably going to need to kill it yourself. So, because Henry's companions were so suspicious, they decided to follow the man's tracks back into the woods. And they followed them for about a day, at which point they came to a camp. And at that camp, they found a fire and several human body parts, the, the remains of a human being. And sitting against the fire was a cooked human hand. They brought the hand back and they questioned the young man about his story. What had happened? When pressed, he confessed that he had been traveling with his aunt, his uncle, and four cousins. And at some point, his uncle had become despondent because he was failing to hunt, failing to provide for the family. And so he asked his wife to kill him, partially worried that he himself would become a Wendigo, that he would break and eat one of his own family members and kill them all. Naturally, his wife refused to do so, but his eldest son, and also the young man that they were interrogating, they, they agreed to do it, and they did. And then they ate him, and then they killed and ate the other children, and left the mother to die. And then they made their way back towards, well, Oak Bay. The remains they had found at the camp about a day back were those of his eldest cousin, who was the last victim. He had eaten his cousin. As I said, the natives believed that there was no coming back from this, and after you ate flesh, you, you would never be satisfied by anything else. And the man was not really helping his position, because he was sitting there in the lodge, kind of refusing to eat any of the normal food that was brought to him, despite the fact that he was starving, and commenting on how fat all of the children looked, which was not in like a insulting or mean way, it was in a they look tasty way. Nom nom, some wagyu kids. So they resolved to kill the man, and they did so with a single axe blow to the back of the head while he was not looking. And that did the trick, and that was the end of that. Brightman also created a chart of what you might call Wendigo symptoms compiled from these accounts and from other scholars' work. These scholars were looking not at the traditional legends, but about real-life encounters with people described as Wendigos. We're talking about direct documentation, first-person primary sources. The most consistent aspect of these encounters was the presence of and refusal to eat or the complete disinterest in normal food. And, in all but one case, the individual self-identified as being a Wendigo. They told people, I'm a Wendigo. And in some of the cases, they threatened to eat people, too. The exception, the sole exception to the self-identification aspect, was Henry's story. So it seems that while legends of the Wendigo are often associated with some sort of giant cannibal monster, they are also associated with individual people people who have succumbed to a sort of cannibal psychosis as a result of starvation. 
This sort of sickness may have also overcome Louis Kiesberg of the Donner Party, though he was not the only cannibal there, and he was kind of an ass the whole time. If you want to see more about that, we have a very long Donner Party video. Also, as another little sidebar, the TV show Outlander, and I assume the book as well, uh, has a character named Wendigo Donner, and he's not even Algonquin. He is, he is Mohawk. Oof! Outlander does a lot of stuff really well. I feel like it, it's generally a pretty solid series when it comes to the history, but between that and their depiction of Freemasonry, I was a little perturbed. <laughs> anyway, in observing the Wendigo legend, it seems that what we're dealing with here are two concepts that are related to one another. There is the Wendigo, the cunning cannibal giant feared by all, and there is the Wendigo, the cannibal madman consumed beyond self-preservation by the allure of human flesh. It's not a perfect fit with the Uruk Indian devil, but there are certainly some similarities there, from the amount of fear they induce to their wild ways. And there is a parallel here to the Bigfoot concept, the ways that many, many, many different tribes will take this one archetype and they will present it in different ways. Even in completely unrelated cultures, you will get a story that really bears a lot of the same characteristics. And one example that is nearby to the Algonquin-speaking tribes is that of the Cherokee Devil. The Cherokee are an Iroquoian-speaking people who likely originated along the Mississippi River near St. Louis, but they eventually migrated and ended up in North Carolina and Tennessee. In their culture, they have stories about a figure known as Tsul Kalu. That term means he has them slanted or sloped, and typically this is understand to refer to the creature's eyes, but others have suggested it might refer to the sloped forehead commonly associated with Sasquatch. The most complete account of the Tsulkalu that I could find was that of a James Mooney compiled in 1902 for the 19th Annual Report of the Bureau of American Ethnology. By the way, Bureau of American Ethnology reports, incredible sources of information. You know how everybody says that the Smithsonian is hiding the evidence of giants? They talk about it openly, not hiding the evidence, they talk about the evidence openly in these reports. Like, they, they talk about how they found mound graves with six and a half, seven foot tall skeletons in them, 12 feet down and covered in white ash. It's fascinating. It's not, you know, proof that there were 12 foot tall people roaming around, but come on, that's cool. Why were they covered in white ash? I have questions. Anyway, in Mooney's account, we get the story of a young woman who lived in the old town of Canuga along the Pigeon River. Mooney included some further information in the notes section of his work, and this old town of Canuga had been abandoned in the American prehistory period. This young woman, who is unnamed throughout the story, is looking for a husband. She's now of age to marry, but her mother tells her she should only marry a man who is a great hunter who can provide her with lots of meat. As a little aside, in some versions of a Paiute legend that we're going to be talking about in a later video, uh, being a man who lives on a mountain and has bounties of meat is also a desirable trait. One night, a stranger comes to her as she's sleeping in the AC, which is a low-built log sleeping hut used for a number of different purposes by the Cherokee, and he offers her this gift of deer meat. He does this in order to ask to court her, and he is a great hunter, and he's doing all of this in the, the Cherokee style. This one, one way that you would present courtship in the Cherokee culture was to give a gift of something like deer meat. You wanted to show that you could provide for your future wife. But since he's a great hunter, and that is the criteria for marriage that her mother gave her, she allows him to spend the night. The only thing is that he insists upon leaving before morning, so she actually never sees him this night. She, it's too dark. These AC are, uh, they have no windows, they're windowless. He continues to visit for several nights, and he always brings a gift. It's usually deer meat, but uh, in this story, he can read minds, or possibly he's always remaining within earshot so he can tell what they're talking about. But in one, in one night, he hears that the mother has said, all of this deer meat is great, but I wish that someone would bring us some firewood. So he comes by, and he drops several entire trees as a gift. The next morning, the young woman's mother complains that she did not receive chopped firewood, but entire trees, and how was she to chop them up to make firewood? So it's good to see that the trope of the ungrateful mother-in-law is consistent across all colors and creeds. And because she was ungrateful, he didn't come back the next night and chop it into firewood, he just took the trees away entirely. Now, it's never explicitly stated, but at some point along this process, the two do marry, 
and the young woman who is now married to the great hunter stays in her mother's village because the Cherokee were a matrilocal society, which meant that when you married, you moved into your wife's family's village. Cherokee marriages could also be polygamous, but due to the matrilocal issue, you would typically marry members of the same family, so a woman and then her sisters or cousins. Eventually, the mother wants to meet her new son-in-law, and the daughter says, okay, I'll ask, but he says, ah, you know, I'm really, I'm concerned that she will find my appearance distasteful or, or frightening, so I'm not really comfortable with it, but the, the young woman insists, so he says, all right, you can bring her in to see me, but only if you promise that she will not comment on my appearance, or specifically, there's... There's a specific term, but I, I have trouble pronouncing it. But he says, just make sure she doesn't say anything about how I look. So the young woman brings her mother into the, the AC and says, here's my husband. And the mother takes one look at the man and says, Uska say to you, yells it a few times and runs off. And that means very dangerous man in Cherokee. This is because the hunter was a giant with long slanted eyes whose body reached across the hut in its entirety even as he was laying down doubled over. Tsukalu, as he is called by James Mooney, tells his wife that he's very angry about this and he's decided that he's going to leave and go back to his homeland so that she will never have to see him again, the mother at least. And, you know, he just heads off towards a place called, and I'm gonna try and get this right, Tsunegun Yi. He then returns not long after to ask after his child, but in the meantime, as he was gone, his wife had her period, and she says, well, I didn't have a child. I had my period, and my mother threw the blood in the river. And the Tsukalu says, well, where did she throw the blood in the river? So he goes to the river, and he looks in, and he finds a worm, and he plucks out the worm, and as he carries the worm back to his wife, the worm grows into a baby girl. Aiden, I feel like we've seen this before, a, a small thing taken out of the water turning into a person. Now that they have a baby girl, they decide that they probably should cohabit, so the young woman returns with her husband, Sulkalu, to his homeland, to Tsunegun Yi. And this place is typically identified with Tennessee Bald, which is a peak in the North Carolina section of the Appalachian foothills. And this would have been about 13 miles south of the old village of Canuga, where the woman lived. According to Mooney, this settlement was abandoned during American prehistory, so this story dates to at least as far back as 1600, if not earlier. Or maybe not dates back to, but it at least takes place before 1600. Sometime after this, the young woman's brother hears about her marriage and wants to go visit her sister and meet the man. So he goes to visit his mother's settlement, only to be told that they, he, nobody knows where she went. She just went off into the mountains. But the brother is a skilled tracker, so he heads off into the mountains, follows Suwakalu's giant footprints, and eventually comes to Tennessee Bald to Tsunegun Yi, where he hears drums and voices seemingly coming from inside the mountain. As he walks around, he sees a cave opening up on a steep slope, and from the very small amount he can see in, he sees the head and shoulders of people dancing. And he himself can't climb the slope because it's too steep, so he just kind of stands there and waits. And he decides, you know, if I can't get up there myself, I should just call out. So he calls out for her sister, and eventually she emerges, and she climbs down the slope with her two children now to greet her brother. However, happy as she is to see her brother, she won't invite him in, so he has to return back to his own settlement without seeing Sulkalu. He does come to the mountain several more times, hoping for a different outcome, but every single time, his sister says, sorry, you can't come in. I'm the only one who will talk to you. She just keeps insisting on meeting him outside. Then, some four years after leaving with her husband to go live off in the wild in a cave, anything sounding familiar yet? She returns home and tells her mother that Sulkalu is hunting nearby and that she intends to go back to the mountain with him, but if she would like to see her husband, the mother, then she could come early the next morning and they would meet. And if her mother was too late, then they would leave a bounty of deer meat for them as a gift either way. Now, the reason I mentioned the cave and the mountain and the living alone and all of that is because I want to make sure that the point about the parallel to the Yurok Indian devil is driven home, and I probably could have been a little bit more eloquent about it, but I want to move on in the story. We'll do all of that analysis in part two of the Native American Bigfoot bit we're doing right now. Her mother immediately rushes to go get her brother to tell her brother about the, the opportunity to meet Sulkalu. So, her brother and her mother go out the next morning, but unfortunately they are just slightly too late. But there is, of course, a bounty of deer meat and enough to feed the whole village. So they go back and they tell everybody, hey, come, come get some deer meat, come get some venison, we're gonna eat well. 
After this, the brother returns to the mountain once more, and his sister finally lets him inside, but she's the only one in there. He can't see anybody else. A voice calls out to him and says that if, if the brother wants to see Tsul Kalu, he would need new, well, it says specifically a new dress, but I'm thinking this means new clothes. And he asks the brother if he will agree to these terms. The brother says yes, and then Suwakalu tells him, All right, any of your people who wish to see me, they will need this new dress. So what you have to do is you must go into your townhouse, your, your central community building, and you must stay there fasting for seven days. And then I will bring you the new clothes, and while you're doing that, you must not eat, and you must not raise the war whoop. Once the seven days are over, he'd bring them the new clothes. The brother says, sure, fine, good, that works for me. And then he heads back and he tells all the people, here's what we need to do to see Tsukalu. And the whole village is very excited about it. So they all gather in the townhouse and they fast for the full seven days, all except for one man who each night sneaks out to find something to eat and then returns to the townhouse. And then on the seventh morning, they all heard a great noise like the thunder of rocks rolling down the side of Tsunagunyi. And for the most part, everyone kind of hunkers down, they hold on to each other, but they don't leave, they don't panic, they just stay in there, except that guy who couldn't keep himself from going out to eat each night, he panics, freaks out, runs outside, and raises the war whoop, at which point the thundering sound stops, then restarts and kind of recedes into the distance towards Tsunagun Yi. When it finally dies out, the people exit the townhouse, and they realize no new dress has been left for them. Confused about the situation, the brother of the young woman goes to the mountain to ask what's happened. The voice of Tsukalu speaks to him and tells him that because his people didn't follow their end of the bargain, he's not going to reveal himself, and now none of them will ever see him. The brother, of course, protests and says, well, it was just the one guy, you know, it, it's not it's not the rest of our fault, let us redo it, we'll do it right this time. And Tsukalu still says no. And that is where the story just kind of ends. This was the version given to Mooney by a man named Swimmer. He was a Native American, a Cherokee, from the Cherokee ancestral lands who lived there until he died in 1899. Of course, many of the Cherokee headed west along the Trail of Tears, uh, by force, of course. As many of you probably know, most of the Cherokee were forcibly relocated to Oklahoma during the Indian Removal Act period on what is colloquially known as the Trail of Tears. This is important because if the story is as old as it seems to be, then the locations given probably weren't kind of brought in and associated with new places. They were the original locations in the story. Along with the version that Mooney recorded from Swimmer, he also includes a version from a John Wofford, who was a Cherokee man living in Oklahoma, but who was born likely in Cherokee ancestral lands in 1806. And he had an account that his grandmother had told to him. And his grandmother said this took place long before her time. And since it's not mentioned that, you know, oh, this was in my grandfather's time or my great-grandfather's time, we can assume, based on how storytelling typically works within a lot of these cultures, that this was, she considered this to be before any of her immediate ancestors. So a long time ago, several generations back. If we assume 20 to 30 years between generations, that means his grandmother was probably born between 1760 and 1770, which means that if this story was told to her by somebody before her grandfather, we're probably looking at around 1600. And in her version of the story, her people were visited by the Tsulnil Kalu, who were named as such because they had the appearance of Tsul Kalu. These were a race of people who had slanted eyes and stood twice the height of a normal man, and they said they had come from a land far to the west. Now, depending on how you define far, that could be anywhere from the Appalachians to the Pacific coast. The reason I find that interesting is because in the version Mooney presented from Swimmer, they came from, well, Tsukalu himself came slightly from the south. So I'm curious, you know, where, where all of this would have happened. How, where is far to the west? Are these some of the Cherokee who were living more on the central side of North Carolina, and so this was far to the west for them? In any case, I just, I think it's all very interesting. Also interesting is that the Cherokee are not the only group in the American Southeast to have a story about giants who live to some far extreme of their cultural territory. I say that because the Seminoles seem to have their own version.
The Seminoles, unlike the Cherokee, were a Muscogean-speaking people who are most commonly associated with Florida, and they had a story of what they called the Esti Kapkaki, or in English, the Tall Man. Unfortunately, the only reference I can find to the specific Esti Kapkaki comes from James Henri Howard's Oklahoma Seminoles, published in 1984 after his death in 1982. So it is probably important to note that the people he was speaking to lived in Oklahoma, so this is after the Indian Removal Act. It's possible that stories changed around, that they mixed and mingled with the other Native American groups that were forced into Oklahoma, but point is, I, I just wanted to give that disclaimer. But James Howard describes the SD Kapkaki of the Seminoles as resembling humans, but at least 10 feet tall and covered in gray hair, and they are foul smelling. And according to Oklahoma Seminole Willie Lena, interviewed by James Howard, his father had seen one when Willie himself was a child, and his father had told his mother that it carried a club made of a large tree branch from one of the trees on their property. This property was in Weewaka, Oklahoma. This, so far as I can tell, is the only academic use of the term SD Kaptaki, but I did find another seminal story involving giants in a 1945 article by Robert F. Greenlee entitled Folk Tales of the Florida Seminole. It tells of a large hummock, which is a forested mound above a marsh, uh, north of Lake Okeechobee, where the tall men live. And it talks about how no man has ever seen the giants, but they were tall as trees and had the same bones as men. And it, it almost seems that the story is suggesting that they disguised themselves as trees. It says that they could stand stock still and be, basically look like a tree. It's not particularly informative to the broader legend, but it does tell us that this tall man story could possibly be connected to Florida, and it could have followed them out of Florida. Still, what we're dealing with here is where the tall men live, which is not, I can't say for sure that that is the same thing. However, we do have this more modern legend of the Florida skunk ape. We actually do have a very old drunk folklore segment on the skunk ape over on our Patreon. If you have any interest in seeing that, it's accessible for just $1 a month. Also, just a little heads up, Drunk Folklore will be returning as a live show exclusive for Patreon members and YouTube channel members. I would go more into the skunk ape, but from what I've been able to find, there's really, it, it seems to be its own thing that's disconnected from the native legends. I've seen a lot of claims that there are documents dating back to 1600 describing this creature, but none of them seem to have ever been produced for public use. Like, no, nobody's ever come forward with them. And as such, you can't prove, you can't look at the provenance, you can't tell, all right, is this genuinely from 1600? Like, if I were to look at it, well, I mean, if it was in English, I could look at it and tell you if it's right. Somebody who studies back the same kind of thing with Spanish might be able to tell you, all right, well, this Spanish matches the year 1600 versus this Spanish is clearly somebody trying to write like it was 1600. My point in saying that is that until historians are allowed to look at these exact documents that the southernmost skunk ape society claims they have or had in 1977, you can't trust it. You, you just got to kind of assume that it's, you know, people making stuff up for money. And once again, my point in saying this is that I don't think the documents are publicly available anywhere, so you can't trust what the people writing about them who claim to have them say. But all of that said, this series of legends has taken us rather far away geographically from where we started the video. But what's truly fascinating is how little changes from one story to another. The Wendigo being something of an outlier, the tales of the Tsulkalu and Esti Kapkaki, as limited as the latter are, bear a good amount of resemblance to a story, or a, a group of stories, I should say, told by members of the Klamath tribes, who to this day are located just north of Yurok territory in southern Oregon. Keep in mind, the Yurok lived along the Klamath River. Now, the Klamath have been in the area a very long time, and their mythology includes a story that describes the eruption that created Crater Lake. That eruption happened 7,700 years ago. And off the bat, I'll admit that I was hesitant to include this section, as essentially all of the information I could find came from the TV show Finding Bigfoot. In the end, I chose to include it because the episode goes over several first-hand encounters as they are told by members of the Klamath tribes, and they seemed very serious about it, the storytellers. And while I, I do think Finding Bigfoot is a little bit of a silly show, I will say that the people who, who are hosting it, the people doing the investigation, for the most part to me, do seem to be good people. 
I would trust them, if not their producers, to be honest about what they say. In any case, Tribal Council member Taylor Tupper, at the beginning of the episode, explains that the Klamath have a concept of their own Bigfoot. This is called Mata Khagmi, or Kagmi. Now, I was unable to find this term in any Klamath or Modoc dictionary, nor in any academic literature or scholarship whatsoever, so if I have any Klamath speakers in the audience, anybody who comes from that culture, I would love to get your clarification on whether or not you are familiar with this story, and if you are, where it came from, as far as you know. That's because, so far as I can tell, the sole source on this is a guy named Tawani Wakawa Shush, who claimed that his grandfather was a Modoc by the name of Tawani Wakama, and he was once saved from a fatal timber rattler bite by a family of these Matakagmi, by, by these Sasquatches. And while the Modoc are related to the Klamath, both languages coming from the same family and both groups coming from the same region, Shush was not. Tawani Wakama Shush, given name William Bernard Shush, was the grandson of Edward Decker on his mother's side, Dr. Francis Marion Shush on his father's. Neither of those men were Modoc, nor were they from the Pacific Northwest. In fact, so far as I can tell, neither of them were even remotely Native American. And according to a newsletter that I found that contained an article written by William Bernard Shush's nephew, uh, he also at one point claimed to be a German for some reason and added Vaughn to his name, and he was a uh, a hollow earth believer, so it seems that he was it was just a little out there and nobody's really sure what his motivations were, even his family. They just said he was kind of a little a little mad and they weren't sure why. So he's probably not the most reliable source, and it's frustrating that there's no real academic literature on this. Lack of conventional scholarship aside, the Klamath Tribal Council invited the Finding Bigfoot crew to come to the reservation, to look around, to speak to people, and they even brought everyone in for an assembly. Addressing this assembly of Klamath tribal members who had been invited to share their stories of their encounters with Bigfoot, Councilwoman Tupper introduced their, their version of Bigfoot as a keeper of the forests who ensures that the woodlands are treated properly. Following that, the Finding Bigfoot team asks the room for a show of hands who here believes they have had an encounter with a Sasquatch, and I'd say a solid third to a half of the room raises their hands. Camille Delorme told everybody that she and her husband, Scott, had been out fishing when they had looked across the creek and seen, just kind of parting some bushes, two figures, two Sasquatches. One appeared to be standing up, one appeared to be crouching. And she said that at another point during the trip, she heard some sort of screech or screaming sound. As for the appearance of these Sasquatches, she doesn't really give any information. They're just broad, tall and broad. The next story they highlighted came from a Dion Kroom who was driving down a two-lane road on his way to go hunting when he, his brother, and his wife saw something out of the ordinary standing on the side of the road, and it made eye contact with them and then bounded across the road in three steps. He told the Finding Bigfoot team, I knew it was a Bigfoot, and described that when it went from standing to running, it crouched forward a bit before taking off, which, if you've watched Olympic sprinters, if you have watched NFL wide receivers, anything like that, that's kind of the position that a human being takes before they go to sprint. As for a height estimation, Dion said that it was approximately seven and a half feet tall, but once again, there's no real details about its appearance. The third highlighted story was that of Candy Uses Arrow and her son Gary John Jr., who were out elk hunting for her birthday using an elk bugle when things got a little funky. They could hear the elk approaching when suddenly the forest just went dead quiet. They then heard these rustling and grunting sounds over to one side and swung their spotlight around to make eye contact for a solid 15 seconds with what they described as an eight and a half foot tall figure before they decided it would be best to get out of there and ran for the truck. They eventually returned to the location with the Finding Bigfoot team and using one of the Finding Bigfoot guys as a reference, they, they re-pegged the height to about 10 feet. Also, while they were out there, Gary John Jr. told the team that there was this canyon that the elders always said not to go to for fear of Bigfoot, and that they referred to it as Napstam Canyon. Now, I went and tried to find where Napstam Canyon is. It seems like, according to the episode, and again, I can't tell how much this is embellished, but according to the episode, this is kind of a place that you have to have special tribal permission to go. 
So I couldn't really find it on any maps. The only place that's got a dam in the game of the canyon is very close to an occupied building, like within shouting distance, I think it was about 600 feet, and not that far off from some occupied ranches as well. So I would doubt it's that. I'm guessing this is a local name that is kept sort of within the community. Well, now the name isn't kept within the community, but the location itself. Based on the paper map sitting on the hood of a pickup truck that they had in the episode, uh, that there was never a top-down angle of, I, I think that this canyon would be somewhere to the southeast of Upper Klamath Lake. And based on the comments made in the video, it is a place that has a river running through, and then there also appears to be a little bit of flatland. I'm not telling you that so you can go and find the canyon and, you know, disturb whatever the sacred tribal nature of it is, I'm telling you so that you have an idea of the habitat. Also during that assembly bit at the beginning of the episode, there are two other unnamed individuals who discuss how it moans. Uh, one says that it howls, and then there's actually another one that says that they came down from uh, Yamsey Mountain. In all honesty, the episode isn't really all that revealing, but what is revealing is a blog post written by Taylor Tupper for the official Klamath Tribe's website on March 18th, 2016. In that post, which is telling people that this episode of the show is coming out and the Klamath Tribes were featured, hey, you should go watch it, she also says that this Keeper of the Woods is present in all three cultures represented on the Klamath Reservation. She then gives the name of this entity or creature in each of those languages. In Modoc, Matakagni. In Klamath, a word that I could not find anywhere on the internet, let alone find a pronunciation guide, but is something along the lines of Ye Ahya Has. And in the Yahuskin Paiute, Site Ka, most commonly known as the Red Haired Giants of Lovelock Cave. That is where we'll be starting the next part of the series, examining the better documented Bigfoot associated legends from Lovelock, Nevada to Portlock, Alaska, and everything in between. And with all of that out of the way, if you would like to support what we're doing here at the Lore Lodge and get access to those new live drunk folklore streams, you can become a channel member here on YouTube, or you can become a member of our Patreon for just $1 a month. You can also support us by buying our coffee from Tableau Roasting Company. I designed it myself, it is delicious. Or getting our merch via the little uh, store icons you'll see below this video. The best place to get updates on what's going on with the channel as well as interact with the community is our Discord, which you can get to by going to https colon slash slash bit dot ly slash join the lodge. You can also catch these discussions live here on this channel. We do a podcast weekly on Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Currently it's on hiatus, but it will be back at the end of March 2024 if you're seeing this video before the show is back. You can also check us out on our other channels, The History Hut, The Weird Bible, The Lore Lounge, and my personal channel, Aiden Mattis, where we do everything from record music to, you know, battle the automatons in Helldivers 2. PJ's actually here, for those of you that have, you know, heard of PJ before. PJ, come here. Poke your head in. Come say hi to the larger Lore Lodge audience. This is PJ. He, he helps me with music stuff and streaming. Thank you, PJ. We're adding lads to the lodge. And finally, we'd like to thank Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring with us not only to make this video, but also to help me get the payment I deserve after my Bigfoot incident. Once again, I'm Aiden Mattis, and thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge.